Welcome to Military Analytics. The Russian Navy played a major role, especially in supporting the war effort of the Russian troops on the ground. The Russian Navy is one of the few navies in the world, and reducing the effectiveness of the Russian Navy has become an essential mission for both Ukraine and NATO. The majority of NATO's naval power is supplied by the U.S. Navy and for the U.S. to be effective in the region. Naval supply lines must also be present here. In this video, we will tell you what the U.S. Navy is doing to stay active in the region. The U.S. Navy rarely reveals the whereabouts of its submarines. But while U.S. officials warned that Russian submarines are more active and carrying new weapons closer to U.S. shores, it makes them more visible in the North Atlantic. William Houston, the commander of U.S. Navy submarine forces, announced that since late 2020, his submarines have made multiple visits to Tromso in northern Norway, the Danish-controlled Faroe Islands and Iceland. We've increased our activity in the Atlantic. We're watching this very closely. And our NATO partners and allies are absolutely critical in this, Houston said at the Naval Air Space Symposium outside Washington, D.C. last month, referring to a base in Scotland. Houston noted that for submarines in the North Atlantic, Access to these ports means they can replace people from these subs within hours, when it would often take days for them to enter Faslin. And so they said it gives them an incredible opportunity and an incredible strategic position to do that. So what are the benefits of these stopping points for the Navy? The U.S. Navy focused less on submarine activities in the high north after the Cold War, but its attention in the region has increased over the past decade, as seen in its sub-operations and anti-submarine warfare exercises. There was a time when the Russian threat was waning and there were some higher priorities elsewhere. But the Navy is increasing the number of submarine deployments to the high north. A Norwegian Navy official said that in January 2018, Allied submarines entered Norwegian waters or ports three to four times a month to exchange supplies or personnel. Announcements of such visits appear to have increased since 2020, when Norway allowed NATO submarines to use a port near Tromsø. In August 2020, the Navy said USS Seawolf, a West Coast-based attack submarine, made a short stop for personnel around Tromso. This was followed by visits from USS New Mexico in May 2021 and 2022 by USS Washington, the USS Albany, USS South Dakota, HMS Ambush, and USS Newport News, all of which were attack submarines. The visits reflect the growing defense cooperation between Norway and its NATO allies. Tromso gives the U.S. a place to tow submarines, repair material things, and exchange personnel. Denmark has also opened the Faroe Islands as it can provide short breaks for staff, an absolutely key position for the United States. In August 2022, the U.S. Navy released a chart showing the USS Georgia cruise missile submarine in or near the Faroe Islands. Us officials said the Navy was working very closely with Iceland for short stopovers there and Iceland's foreign minister said U.S. submarines that don't carry nuclear weapons would be allowed to make short transits. Submarines stop in Iceland to exchange supplies and crews. And this decision is a part of Iceland's policy to support the growing monitoring and response capacity of allied nations in the North Atlantic. In recent weeks, the Navy said USS San Juan attack submarine made a short stop for supplies and personnel off the west coast of Iceland, the first such visit by a U.S. submarine reducing travel time has a significant impact on what submarines can do at sea to return to Faslin for spare pots or to disembark a crew member. We routinely miss missions and even have to cancel missions because of things like that. That way we can get that guy off the boat right away or we can get those spare pots right away and be there in one day. So that's a huge difference, he said. Some tasks, such as mapping pots of the Arctic, can be paused without too much trouble, but others are more time-sensitive. But if U.S. subs are trying to track down a Russian submarine operation or some kind of Russian exercise, a one-week delay likely means missing information. So what steps is the U.S. taking to prevent the Russian presence in the region? Over the past year, tracking Russian submarines has become a more pressing task for NATO, and the waters between the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans are vital to that. Mission to reach the Atlantic submarines from Russia's mighty northern fleet depart from their base in the Barents Sea and sail between northern Norway and the Svalbard archipelago to the Norwegian Sea, and then through what is known as the Greenland Iceland UK Gap. These crossing points at both ends of the Norwegian Sea allow NATO forces to more easily monitor Russian submarine movements. 
Russia's submarine fleet is smaller than its Soviet predecessor, but U.S. officials and experts say Russia now has submarines with more advanced sensors and weapons, including ground attack cruise missiles. Of particular concern are Russia's Severodvinsk class submarines, three of which have been in service since 2013. With a level of silence comparable to Western attack submarines and their ability to strike critical infrastructure, such as seaports from greater distances. The Severodvinsk class submarines worried NATO officials. Russia plans to build at least nine of these, and U.S. officials are already warning of their presence near the U.S. General Glenn Van Herc, in charge of operations around North America as head of the U.S. Northern Command, told lawmakers in March that Russian submarine activity off the U.S. coast is definitely increasing. In the past year, Russia has also deployed Severodvinsk class submarines to the Pacific, so no longer just the Atlantic. It will likely take a year or two before it becomes a potentially permanent threat to the United States, 24 hours a day. In addition, Russian submarine forces were not adversely affected by the war in Ukraine. Russians are more active than they seem for years. Patrols in and across the Atlantic are at a higher level than has been seen in years. The increasing effectiveness and complexity of Russia's submarines is the driving factor behind the increase in U.S. submarine operations in the high north and the more frequent announcements about them. Part of that is making the Russians understand that the U.S. is doing this during the Cold War. Us attack submarines operated in the high north to allow the Soviets to keep attack submarines nearby to protect their ballistic missile submarines. The goal now may be to make Russia feel with attack submarines that the U.S. is in Russia's backyard so they need to keep more of their best boats at home to protect these missile submarines. The U.S. Navy has clearly increased the visibility of submarine deployments in both the High North and the Western Pacific to try to influence the decision-making process of potential adversaries. Because otherwise, in terms of security, the United States would get nowhere. The distribution of U.S. submarines in Europe and its surroundings in this way is, of course, to try to prevent the Russian presence in the region. But Russia's expanding submarine fleet will become a major threat to the U.S. and NATO in the future if the necessary measures are not taken. The fact that the USA has the most tense relations with Russia due to the Ukraine war and with China due to the Taiwan tension and Russia and China have a historical alliance. If no action is taken now, it may lead to the USA and other NATO member countries in the future. The United States therefore needs to increase its effectiveness both around Europe and in the South Pacific. Located in the eastern region of Ukraine, the direction of attacks and violent clashes started to shift from the east of Ukraine to the south as the fire of freedom in eastern Ukraine spread to the southern front lines of the country. The tension reached its peak, especially in the Zaporizhia Kherson and Melitopol Triangle, because these three regions are of great importance for the capture of the most strategic center of the war. Yes, we are talking about Crimea. Ukrainians have intensified their activities on the southern front lines, especially in recent days, in order to retake the Crimean Peninsula, wanting the war to end and completely clear the Russian troops in the country. The Ukrainians took a striking step in and around the city of Melitopol Zaporizhia region. Officials told TASS that the 40-000 strong force of the Ukrainian army is in Huliai Pol, near Melitopol. In other words, the Ukrainian armed forces had started offensive operations to encircle Melitopol with its huge army. When we look at the topographic map, we can see that there is a distance of 152 kilometers between Huli I Pol and Melitopol. The situation shows us the possibility of Ukrainian partisans to support the huge 40-000 strong Ukrainian army in Huli I Pol because, as you know, Ukrainian partisans are taking active offensive missions intensively, especially on the southern front lines of Ukraine. Ukrainian partisans provide not only operational but also intelligence data to the Ukrainian armed forces. On the other hand, the distance between Zaporizhia and Huliai Pol is about 120 kilometers. So in any case, the Ukrainian forces could get support from both Zaporizhia and Ukrainian partisans in Melitopol. For their 40-000 man army in Huli I Pol to completely encircle Melitopol. Also, local officials pointed out that there are several communities in the area with the name of Prishib. The group in question is located in the Sinelnikov district of the Dnipropetrovsk region, not far from Huli Y Pol, which still exists as a popular force on Ukrainian soil. 
and it is known that this group still plays an active role in the village of Prashib in the Nikolaevskaya district of the Zaporizhia region, 50 kilometers from Melitopol. Russia's situation in Melitopol was seriously endangered due to Ukraine's latest military initiative in this region. The last Russians attempted an attack in Melitopol recently. In the past days, that is, before the Ukrainians besieged Melitopol with their large army of 40,000, a group of Russian soldiers was sneaking on foot among the large fields and bushes to launch an attack on this city. The Russian troops numbered about 40 people. This group of Russian soldiers was sent to the southern front line, not far from the Ukrainian-controlled village of Julia Palowski. Viktor, one of the drone operators in the Ukrainian army, discovered this 40-man Russian unit was advancing in Melitopol. Viktor sent the coordinates of the Russian troops back to the main base of the Ukrainian Southern Front Command. As the coordinates reached the Ukrainians, another unit hit the Russian force of 40 with a modern shell at Melitopol. As a result of this operation carried out by Ukraine's Southern Operational Command, many Russian soldiers died. It is claimed that only a few people survived from this 40-person Russian military group. Similar raids followed again in Melitopol, typically involving five or six Russian soldiers. Ukrainian UAV operator Viktor, on the other hand, stated that this is a new tactic. The Russians were now trying to attack the Ukrainian army with small attack groups on the southern front lines of Ukraine, but on the defensive. Viktor's Special Air Intelligence Unit, known as Vortex, still operates from a series of forward trenches dug around Julia Polska. It is unclear whether Russia will be able to launch a decisive attack here or elsewhere in the east. Russian forces are slowly advancing so far, including a few villages in the northeast by the Russian border. The Russians have made only incremental gains these days. The top priority of the Russian troops is actually to capture Bahamut where clashes have been going on for months. But the war can be decided in the critical area in southern Ukraine right now. Both sides built deep defensive positions along a snake-like front line throughout the Zaporizhia region. If Russia was to encircle the eastern army concentrated in the Ukrainian garrison cities of Kramatorsk and Sloviansk, it must break through Hulii Pole and sweep north. But as you know, there is currently a huge army of the Ukrainian armed forces in Hulii Pole. In other words, it is not possible for the Russians to realize this aim for now. Meanwhile, to encircle Melitopol, the flat terrain at Hulii Pole is most likely the site for a Ukrainian counterattack. Military analysts expect this to happen in late March or April. The aim will be to break through the Russian lines in these areas and liberate the occupied city of Melitopol. According to Russian bloggers, mercenary reinforcements from the Wagner Group were recently sent to the city by buses to prevent this from happening. Theoretically, if Melitopol falls, Ukrainian forces will be able to advance into separate directions. After a fierce siege, a broad front line could be opened towards the port of Mariupol, which Russia largely controls in the spring of 2023. On the other hand, some observers suggest an offensive south from Zaporizhia towards Melitopol to split the Russian fronts in return for the Ukrainian forces besieging Melitopol with a massive 40-000 strong army. Other war analysts await for their maneuvers east of Lyman to retake the Luhansk Oblast, or there is talk of crossing the mouth of the Dnipro River to continue the reconquest of the Kherson Oblast. As activity continues in the south of Ukraine, Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova confirmed that there are internal clashes within the Kremlin's inner circle, and the Kremlin has handed over central control over Russian information space, and that the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, apparently cannot fix this easily. Kremlin journalists, academics, and Novorossiya supporters held a forum in Moscow on the practical and technological aspects of information and cognitive warfare in monitored realities. During a panel discussion, Zakharova stated that the Kremlin cannot copy the Stalinist approach due to clashes between the ambiguous Kremlin elite. The forum came to the fore at the thought of Russia establishing a modern equivalent office to the Soviet Information Bureau to centrally control the internal information space. Zakharova's statement supported many of her long-standing assessments of the notable and deteriorating Kremlin regime and knowledge space control dynamics. It was clear that there was great friction in the Kremlin among key members of Russian leader Vladimir Putin's inner circle, with Putin over time handing over much of the Russian information space to various semi-independent actors. 
and it seems that Putin was unable to take decisive steps to regain control over the Russian information space. It was unclear why. Zakharova, a veteran senior spokesperson, openly acknowledged these issues in a public meeting. Zakharova may be the first to directly discuss these issues to temper Russian nationalist mill bloggers' expectations for the Kremlin's current capabilities to rally around a unified narrative and possibly even a unified policy. In addition, while the resistance movements continued in the occupied territories of Ukraine, the Moscow administration began to gather collaborative units in Crimea and listen to the phones of public employees. Residents on the peninsula were told to switch to Russian passports and were threatened that their cars would be confiscated if they did not do so. The aim of these efforts by Moscow was to gather volunteer units to counter the active resistance movements on the peninsula through the Russian authorities in Crimea and to close the police gap. The units. Moscow is trying to create will patrol urban areas and hunt down residents who act as saboteurs and artillery. Scouts for Ukraine in the Mariupol and Kherson regions to the Russian regime is trying to threaten its control and orders public servants to hand over personal phones so that software to record their conversations can be installed in the occupied areas of Kherson Oblast. FSB representatives conduct extensive searches of residential buildings and conduct telephone checks. Russian authorities accelerated mandatory passporting in the occupied territories further emphasizing that the link between Russian passports and access to services from March pensions and other social benefits will be available only to those who have Russian documents. In occupied Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and other provinces in the southern region of Ukraine, car owners are also forced to re-register their cars under Russian law because this process requires a Russian passport. Moscow said they would confiscate cars without a Russian license. Russia is trying to win the war in Ukraine by applying unjust war strategies. But the Ukrainians still have not stopped defending despite all of this. In the coming days, it is foreseen that the tension in the war will increase much more. The war in Ukraine seriously mobilized the naval forces of the world giant, especially in critical areas such as the Indo-Pacific, the Sea of Japan, the Arctic Ocean, and the Mediterranean. The increase in the naval forces of the USA, one of the most important allies of Ukraine, causes tension in Moscow. Russia, on the other hand, continues its rapprochement with China in this global hellhole and directs its military exercises to support China's blockade of Taiwan. The fact that Russia carries out such actions in maritime areas not only disturbs the United States, but also seriously worries the EU and NATO member states, in particular, Russian leader Vladimir Putin's desire to highlight his navy equipped with nuclear missiles is considered by some groups as a factor that puts the world in danger. But many military and war analysts view the Russian leader's efforts as just a cry for help. The most concrete proof of Russia's panic in the face of the U.S. Navy, which has the most powerful navy in the world, was seen in the Pacific recently. The Russian military tested a nuclear submarine in the far east of the country during exercise is amid international tensions over its invasion of Ukraine and Vladimir Putin's warning about his country's naval capabilities. Russian media reported that the Tomsk ship simulated destroying a fake enemy carrier strike group 200 kilometers away using granite anti-ship cruise missiles. The commander of the ship, Tomsk Roman Velikenko, reported that the exercise was part of the Pacific Fleet's combat readiness test which began on April 14. The exercises were conducted near Primorsky Krai, the Kamchatka Peninsula, and the Sea of Okhotsk. The Russians included 25,000 military personnel, 167 ships, including 12 submarines, 89 aircraft and helicopters. In these exercises, Russia's move was described as a response to U.S. naval forces, increasing their presence in both the Pacific and Indian Ocean. In fact, that was exactly the case. Russia continued to receive support from China and its sea areas, but leader Vladimir Putin was taking such measures because of his doubts about the continuity of China's support and because the U.S. was increasing its naval forces. In short, the alarm bells ringing under the Russian rule were heard from the Pacific. Russia's desperate deployment of naval forces in the Pacific and in critical areas such as the Sea of Japan has other purposes. One of these aims is Moscow's desire to use all its naval forces, primarily due to the economic effects of the Ukrainian war and the inability of the Russian defense industry to function adequately. Another aim of the Russian exercises is to show that although Russian forces are investing heavily in Ukraine, 
they still maintain various naval forces elsewhere. In fact, this aim of the Russians stemmed from the fact that they do not want to appear weak in the face of the U.S. Navy power because a large part of the Russian Navy is not involved in Ukraine, and therefore such exercises try to reflect part of Moscow's deterrence. As a result, we can see that the Navy will play a greater role in deterrence and defense in the short to medium term, as Moscow reconstitutes its ground forces. But Russia is far behind the USA in terms of naval forces. While there were currently 58 ships in Russia, there were a total of 296 in the U.S. naval forces. In other words, although the Russians wanted to seize the advantage by gaining the support of China in the naval areas, it seems impossible for them to achieve the same. Since the U.S. Navy is the world's best military naval force. In addition, the Russians have been conducting active exercises in the Sea of Japan lately, as we mentioned, in order to appear as a deterrent in the Navy. The Russian Ministry of Defense recently announced that a Tupolev Tu-22 long-range bombers conducted a combat training flight in the airspace over the neutral waters of the Sea of Okhotsk and the northern part of the Sea of Japan. It is also estimated that Russia carried out such exercises to send a warning to Japan about the potential to retake the Kuril Islands, thinking that Russia was distracted in Ukraine. Japan claims territorial rights over the Kuril Islands, which it calls the Northern Territories, located off the northernmost island of Hokkaido. The islands have been disputed by Moscow and Tokyo since they were taken by the Soviet Union at the end of the Second World War. In 2022, Moscow suspended talks with Japan over the islands to protest the latter sanctions against Russia for its full-scale invasion of Ukraine. But even if Russia suspends the talks, it signals that it continues to work on this issue in order to show its intentions. It is also clear that Russia's recent exercises are a routine signal. Should the US and Japan consider testing Russia in Northeast Asia or anywhere beyond Ukraine's territory? Therefore, for now, there is no more critical situation in the Sea of Japan. Although there is seemingly no danger at the moment, Putin recently stated that the Pacific Fleet can be used in clashes in any direction. In a meeting with Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, Shoigu stated on April 14 that Russia should work on ways to prevent the deployment of enemy forces in the operationally important region of the Pacific Ocean. The Russian Defense Minister referred to Sakhalin, a Russian island in the Pacific Ocean, north of Japan, along with the southern part of the Sea of Okhotsk and the southern Kuril Islands. Moscow claims the islands are part of Russia, although Japan describes it as illegally occupied in a diplomatic document just released by Tokyo. Russia's only reason for making such bold statements is thought to be because it trusts China's support. But there is something that the Kremlin administration, and especially the Russian leader, Vladimir Putin, should not forget. Yes, China is currently the supporter of Russia, although the Beijing administration denies it. But one of the guarantor countries of Ukraine's territorial integrity is the USA, which has one of the strongest armies in the world. In other words, although Russia wants to expand the borders of the chaos it wants to create, the US will not allow it. The US administration will allow neither the Russian threat nor the Chinese risk that could threaten the new world order not only in the Indo-Pacific but also in the Sea of Japan and the territory of Ukraine. Also, it is not seen as a certain fact that China will constantly support Russia. If you remember, the Belarusian administration was one of the most important allies of Russia. However, some tensions and disagreements between Alexander Lukashenko and Vladimir Putin at the time caused a gap between the two countries. For this reason, the Belarusian administration delayed the work in helping Russia in the most critical moment. If we consider that the alliance between Russia and China is shaky, just like the political relations between Lukashenko and Putin, we can see more clearly that the Beijing-Moscow cooperation is purely a relationship of interest. But even the US steps to protect the world order rather than the country's interests. And the fact that this order is based on ending the war in Ukraine is enough to show us the difference once again. Because the US administration is taking steps to protect the territorial integrity of not only Ukraine but also Taiwan, which is facing the Russian and Chinese threat. In summary, the USA continues to fight against the elements that threaten the world with its navy, land and air forces, and the military aid it has sent. We hope that this struggle will eventually liberate Ukraine and Taiwan will continue to enjoy its peaceful days away from China's threat.